People were saying it was hard to find this place, but um, the important people found it. <laughs> and so this is where you're at. Um, we'll talk a little bit here about day one. Uh, if you weren't aware, lunch is available. Uh, we are kind of thinking this uh, is a networking event, and the lunch is going to be an hour and a half, and the breaks are long. Uh, the idea is uh, we, we're going to have some lunch. It's not really fancy. It's 15 bucks a day. It's a sandwich, you know, Coke, cookie, whatever. But the idea is that you can stay here and network with other people. Uh, if you want to do that, you got to see Veronica, and you got to pay her uh, $15 a day for lunch. If you don't want to do that, there's a little cafe right here, but I think 25 people would swamp that. But there's also the bowling alley, and then there's also a cafe at the Walt Disney Museum. So you have choices. You're not held hostage. Um, today, this morning, the coffee service is sponsored by Velodyne LiDAR and Boomerang Carnets. And today, after the program, there will be a hosted reception, although it was for less people than are here. So you're just going to have to drink fast. And that is sponsored by Advanced Systems Engineering. And then I also want to spon uh, thank all of our, our sponsors um, that helped put this on and help keep the door or the gate fee, let's say, reasonable. We're trying to keep the, uh, the tickets reasonable because we realize small business people, especially in an environment with... Uh, regulatory environment that we're in that uh, we don't have a lot of money rolling in so we want to kind of keep it reasonable so people can come we're also streaming to 10,000 people were invited to watch this on the internet live we will also uh, thanks to guest Calderon be taping this editing them out and we will uh, put all of the presentations on the YouTube channel and you can watch those later for free we will also put all of the PowerPoint presentations on the SUAS News SlideShare, and you can access those too for free. Um, so, you know, at some point today during the break or lunch, go back there, talk to these people. These people are all have quality products or something that we need in this industry. So it uh, is in your best interest to speak to them. The other thing, um, some people were talking about Wi-Fi. And there is Wi-Fi, and the password is leadership, and it's not a capital L. I think it's just straight leadership. Um, we have to share that, so let's not, um, don't watch Desperate Housewives or whatever else while you're here. That is, um, the, the Wi-Fi was sponsored by Nexutech. Uh, we figure it's important to have that here. So be kind and share with the rest of your uh, friends. And then I'm going to also uh, do a short spiel on Transport Risk, who was a sponsor of today's program, but he was called away for a deposition. He insures aircraft, and it was a deposition on a manned helicopter that crashed, and they're doing an investigation on that, and he's the insurer, so he cannot be here. But I just wanted to give some of these statistics, because, you know, um, I've been saying for years that there is already a business community out here. This is not new. I, I, and I'm sure a lot of you do the same thing. You kind of crack up. You hear every day, oh, God, we came up with this new use for drones. We can do whatever, you know. And you're like, yeah, that was cute eight years ago. Um, people are out there doing it. Of course, they're doing it underground or in the closet because they don't want to get hammered by the FAA. But uh, anyway, so this is kind of what's going on. This is the insurance that, uh, that he's writing. So 325 policies. Um, he, they're, they're going international. Uh, they're, they're still looking for ways to, um, I wanna, how do I put this nicely? Weed out the yahoos as far as who to insure. And uh, you know, there are some different things in the works uh, that we're trying to do actually through our Kappa and some other groups to try and come up with best practices that people can operate to or testing. So people that insure this type of aircraft know they're insuring someone who, let's say, is a safe operator. And it's not somebody flying over somebody's head. But I just wanted to put that in there because he couldn't be here. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna run right through this deal and I'm gonna try and stay on schedule. We are a half hour late, but the line was long. 
So I'm Patrick Egan, and SUS News is uh, I'm, it's a partnership I do with uh, Gary Mortimer, who is in uh, lives in the Natal in South Africa in the Zulu Kingdom, and it's very interesting having a business partner that lives that far away. But uh, we seem to do okay. So it's been kind of a big year. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of things in the news. Um, I thought this one was kind of funny. I found that on the internet, the Brian Shulman meme. I thought that was funny. So, so some of the other stuff that's kind of gone on this year, uh, drones have been very big again this year. Last year there was a little bit of a lull, but I think this year everybody is ready to do stuff with drones. So we're staying at the hotel, and this one down here, uh, the, the concierge at the Travelage was telling me he was at a hospitality event and there's a hotel up here in Sausalito that delivers champagne to your suite via drone. And I said, well, this is going to require some further investigation um, to make sure that that champagne and not sparkling wine. So we'll have to go up there after the program and see what's going on. So, you know, uh, those of you that know me, I'm an advocate for small business and small unmanned aircraft. And when we say small unmanned aircraft, we're talking 150 kilos and under. I think that 90% of the market is going to be there. I do not believe it'll be in the big stuff. But I also believe that we need community-based standards or some kind of rules because any industry where you're making money, you need rules. Uh, this is the first Paris Air Show. Um, and I think it was in 1909. And uh, it's probably a good thing that there was no FAA because I don't know if any of this French stuff would have flown. It's pretty rickety. I, I got to say, you had some stones to climb in that and fly it around. But my hat's off to those guys. Anyway, and then I, uh, I do have a little video here, if it plays. But we don't have any audio. Okay, anyway, I don't know what happened to our audio guy, but that's not working. But um, this video kind of illustrates, uh, it's, it runs kind of parallel with the Noggles incident, except for the uh, predator did not slam into the school bus in that incident. We do need some sort of standards for training. I, I strictly, I do believe that. We have some of the key factors in our industry. Some of it is going to be the technology. Uh, regulation with the boat anchor, too much regulation is going to kill this industry. Financing, public acceptance, and insurance. You know, uh, anybody who thinks, I talk to people all the time that don't think that they need insurance to be in business. And I say, well, do you, you know, do you live in a house? Yeah, I own my house. Okay, do you like your house? Because when you do something like this, flying over people or some other, uh, you know, harebrained maneuver and you hurt somebody and you're doing that commercially, you're going to get sued and they're going to take you for everything that you have. And then you're going to make the rest of us look bad because you were irresponsible, one, in your operation, and two, you, didn't, you weren't a business person and you didn't have liability insurance. The other thing to think about this is with financing and funding. Some companies are startups. Um, other companies, you know, we're going to need to get started and some of these systems are expensive, like the I, I think it was a AUBSI last year. I went to the AeroVironment booth and I told them I was ready to take home a Puma system today. And, you know, how do we pay for this? How do, we, do you have financing or do you guys take bad checks? <laughs> they didn't have any answer. So I said, okay, well, you know, I guess I can't buy one today. But eventually at one point, I'm going to be buying somebody's aircraft and I'm probably going to need to finance that. And a finance company is going to say, oh, okay, great, sounds good. Who's your insurance agent? And I'm going to go, oh, I need insurance. No, really? Well, of course you need insurance. And you're going to talk to Palms and Associates or another company, and you're going to get coverage for your operation. And then you can probably get your financing and head on down the road um, and start your business. Public acceptance is going to be another thing. Um, and I think it kind of goes hand in hand. I, I've kind of predicted this, that uh, the public acceptance thing, when this stuff, if this stuff is falling out of the sky and hurting people, there's going to be a public backlash on that. They're not going to, people are not going to go for that. Your, your normal everyday Joe, I don't want a drone hitting me in the head. And that's going to be another public acceptance issue. So you have to think about how you're operating. We can't, we have to kind of self-police. 
because uh, and I don't want to beat up on the FAA, but people are not paying attention to current FAA policy. They're out there doing it. There are people questioning that, yada, yada. Uh, we need to get out there and kind of educate those people also. Uh, other thing that we have is, you know, this return on investment in a false economy. And, and people, uh, you know, in this, in the last 10 years that I've been at this, um, I will go to advocacy meetings or regulatory type meetings and people will talk about small unmanned aircraft for about five or 10 minutes and then we're off to the global hawks and the predators. Um, right now, they're, they're trying to bring that number down, but a global hawk's gonna cost you about $255 million. For the same price, you can buy an Airbus A350 or a Boeing 787-9, you know, and we could go into business and start, you know, there's, there's regulation for that and we could find some pilot, co-pilot to work for $20 an hour and start making money. Those are, you know, we're, and we're talking about an operative cost of about $37,500 an hour. It's pretty expensive. I don't know a lot of business cases that can support that kind of hourly flight uh, cost. Then we get down here to the Predator and Reaper that you know keep telling me they have a business plan for this too, but there's about $55 million a copy. And of course, the Hellfire missiles are gonna cost you extra. <laughs> you go down to the bomb store and I'll take, you know, two Hellfires and you know, maybe some in, you know, high explosive, whatever you got here. That's about $7,500 an hour. That still in my mind is not what unmanned aircraft is about in a cost per hour flight time. Then we come down here to, uh, you, you've got your Cessna 172, 1000 with the full Garmin package at about a half a million dollars. Your Scan Eagle system is going to cost you about a million dollars for everything you need. I can't really do too much with the Scan Eagle. I can fly the 172 almost anywhere I want, and it's half the price. So there's no real value in the Scan Eagle that I see right now. Then we come on down, and this is kind of, the, the Puma system is about $450,000. I know it's coming down. We got some AV guys here. Is it still $450,000, or is it, did the price come down? I don't know. And I don't know how much it costs to operate an hour, but even still, I'd still put the cracker barrel at 300 bucks up against the Raven. We, you know, we both flown to get, or uh, the, the Puma. And then we're getting down here where you can buy a UAV or a drone or whatever you want to call it with a camera on it for $79. And technically, yes, it's kind of cheesy, but you know what? I could go out and do roof inspections with that. I could, I could, do, um, I could do bids for construction jobs with that at 79 bucks. And the other thing that, that kind of we, we should think about is the regulatory part of that. If we put too much regulation on that, and we have to try and type certify something like that, it's not gonna be $79 anymore. And the Cracker Barrel's not gonna be $300 anymore. It's, you know, it's gonna be a lot more expensive. So now we're working these regulatory inroads. <clears throat> and my hat's off to the Europeans. We don't hear about this a lot, but you can operate legally in Europe, in, in multiple countries in Europe. And what we have back here is a certification for a company that flies a quadcopter in France. If you do not have certification in France, it's a 75,000 euro fine and or a year in the Bastille. <laughs> so they're serious, but they do have a legal um, pathway to operate. Now, I don't know if you guys monitor the Twitter. I'm on there sometimes I go on rants. I don't know if you catch any of that. I just, uh, my clams get steamed and I go for it. But I, uh, I did catch this one and I did, we did a story about it, you know. Do, 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 just throw this out here. Look, oh yeah, aircraft future article, airworthy and certified. So the watchdog catches that. What does it look like? I want to know. Well, you know, we don't know yet. Okay, well, how to keep it airworthy and certified. We're, we're not sure what that looks like, but there's work going on in RTCA and ASTM. And so, I don't know if people saw that news story, but I wrote a letter to ASTM and an email to Ted Wersbanowski, who's the chair of the ASTM F-38 uh, committee, and I wanted to see a public copy of the standards. 
and they did not give me the public copy of the standards. I personally feel that I'm not paying $250 or $325 or whatever. I'm not paying that to see what's going to be part of the law of the land. It's not doing it. That's, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's not what's in the Constitution. And they're going to show me a public copy or well, I'll just say it where else. Anyway, I have gotten copy from other people in the committee. And we're going to talk about <clears throat> what some of this, these standards look like and this certification looks like. Over here, and I believe that's, I don't have my glasses on, so you might have to look at that later, 2908 I think it is, talks about standard specifications for the aircraft flight manual. And I called this back in 2009 and 10 that that committee would get together and say your manual has to uh, be written to the mill standard. Oh. No, but no, no, we wouldn't do that. No, no, that would be too hard for people. I said, okay, it should be some boilerplate that people could fill out and then make a manual. Um, and it would be something that was uniform that the FAA could recognize. Oh, that's a great idea. You type that up. Oh, okay. So I started typing that up. About six months later, I heard that it was rewritten for me without any knowledge to me. This right here is the manual on how to write a mill standard 3001 manual. Okay? And then there's a handbook. Jason, is the handbook in here? It is in here. So there's, there's, there's the manual on how to write the manual, and then there's a handbook on how to use the manual. Now, when I was still participating with the ASTM, I said, well, gee whiz, you know, um, I don't know where I'm going to fit the tech writing team because I'm going to have the quality assurance team desks in the garage and we're going to be out of room. <laughs> and they all looked at me and rolled their eyes. I'm oh, Patrick again. He's just a, he's a malcontent. And that's one of the nicer things I've been called lately. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, uh, this will never do. A small business guy does not need to write a military standard manual for a small UAS. That's BS. And I'm going after this one. I'm not taking this one lying down. The other one over here that's a lot of fun is the quality, or standard specification for quality assurance of small unmanned aircraft system. And it's got to be like ISO certification. Anyone in this room ever gone through ISO 9001? Oh, we got a couple of heads. Breeze, right? You just went right through that, no paperwork, two days, five bucks, done. Uh, one day, afternoon. Okay, you, you might want to hire this guy to get you through the certification. <laughs> um, again, it talks about a written quality assurance program, quality assurance manager. Um, there is no way a small business is going to be able to be competitive with that. We'll all be. Um, let's say, making ravens. And I don't want to see an industry where we're all uh, pinned there. And I forgot to put that in there. I was going to have the address to contact either AeroVironment or Boeing so you could buy a Scan Eagle or a Puma or a Raven. But I forgot. I got busy. Um, also, the RTCA SC228 work products, that review has got to be on the agenda. I talked to one of the guys over there. He's an expert. He's got 25 years in the military doing human factors. I said, well, don't you think that's going to be a little tough for the small business people? Well, too bad. They're going to have to lump it. It's a mixed company, so I won't tell you what I think about that. But that will not work either, and I'm going after them. And then they're also working on command and control. And there's a couple of companies that are participating that want to make a common radio for you to buy or a standard for you to use. And I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be cheap. And that's not going to work either. So I'm not doing that. I'm not buying that, and I will be going after these guys. OK. And for the younger guys, that is at what was called an LP, a record. <laughs> and I thought I'd just clarify that, because the younger people, you go, yeah, you know, you distributor cap. You mention these old fangled gadgets. And they look at you all like, oh, what's he talking about? So this is kind of my broken record, people that have been kind of following me. Um, I talk about these things. A lot of people say, oh, you know, uh, Egan's outspoken, or he's a hothead, or he's this, or whatever. But this stuff, I didn't, this, this is nothing I did. I didn't do this stuff. 
You know, I didn't give uh, Buck McKeenan $830,000 to push my products. You know, that, that wasn't me. The arc that's going on now, I've been, have people been following this at SUS News? I've been trying to get on that arc since 2011, since I found out that it was happening. There is no small business representation on the UAS arc, and that is BS. Because, the, you know, I tried to figure out, there are two guys from General Atomics on that arc, which is, that's BS. But, you know, you go back to, hmm, who's given the campaign credit? I didn't know, you know, I would have wrote him a check. Instead of buying the Puma, I would have cut him a check. But um, there should be small business representation on this arc. It's just, it's beyond, uh, well, again, we're in mixed company. So we got to work on that. AF ASTM. And the work speaks for itself. There was a pilot standard that got pulled. So I don't know what's in that. Uh, a quote from one of the members is, that Chinese stuff ain't gonna fly. Uh, that was a warning bell for me because most of us are probably flying uh, lower cost systems with parts and pieces from China. And we have some people here that make aircraft in China and they make good products. Uh, again, uh, the military focus, no small business representation. You have to realize with the standards groups that this has been going on. I, I've been dealing with the standards groups. We started with ASTM in 2005. So I'm not, this, this isn't some like flash in the pan for me. And the same thing with the RTCA. I cut out on the RTCA when they made the representative from the Airline Pilots Association the chairperson for the Small Unmanned Aircraft System Subcommittee. And where did you get the logic on that one? Well, he's got some experience, he knows. You know? And I said, yeah, that's, that's like me being the chair for a uh, Part 121 arc or whatever because I rode coach a couple of times. Makes no sense whatsoever. So when they did that, I cut out. ASTM, when they, I fought them once before on showing the standards to the public, and they said they weren't going to do it, and I caused a big stunk, stink, and I quit. Because, again, we're not going to do the tyranny thing. We're going we're gonna to see those standards. The public is going to see those before the NPRM comes out because I'm not going to get stuck with the Military Standard 3001 manual. AUVSI, I'm upset with AUVSI. I do not see effective industry representation and regulatory representation. Some people, I am the Silicon Valley chapter president, but I'm tired of waiting. We've been waiting for years. And uh, that's got to stop. We got to kick it up. I also think that the extrajudicial killing machine has got to go. Killing kids and doing business does not mix. And I did write a letter, and I wanted it on the board agenda to disassociate with General Atomics. And it was not even put on the board agenda. And I'm a, I'm a chapter president. I thought that was pretty shitty. At least we should have had a vote on that. But we did not. FAA, there's talk that you know everybody was looking towards ADSB as a solution for beyond visual line of sight flight. From what I'm hearing from uh, people that are affiliated with one of the standards group, is the uh, FAA is not going to support a public algorithm for ADSB, which means that the liability is going to be on you. And I don't see many companies besides, let's say, Northrop Grumman being able to afford or be able to shoulder that type of liability. So what that means is, is that we're looking at uh, visual line of sight for the foreseeable future. And the punchline on the broken record is small business is locked out. And that's been the name of the game forever. We don't have the money for representation and we're not getting proper representation. And we need to say no more on that. We're ready to work, we're ready to fly, and we want to go. It's been 10 years. We've been horsing around with this, and we, we're, we're really, uh, I know we're getting closer, but I'm tired. And then finally, I wanted to um, thank all of you and all of the SUS News readers for making us the number one UA news outlet. And, and uh, we, we take that uh, with a sense of pride. We try and disseminate all of the information we can to the community and let people be informed on what's going on. I want to thank people for listening to the podcast. Uh, the downloads, it's overwhelming. Since I started, I think we're at about 270,000 downloads, which is great. There's a wealth of information there. I want to uh, thank this, uh, uh, the advertisers, and I want to thank you guys for uh, supporting them. 
Uh, we all want everyone to be successful. And for all of the positive feedback, I, I love going to uh, events and people come up to me and go, oh, God, the SQS News is great. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. We try hard. We work hard. And I also want to thank everyone for supporting the global community. Every time you support one of our advertisers or the paper or the, the or I mean the website or download or whatever else, you're supporting the community and a voice for the community that says we're here and we're ready to go to work. Any questions for me? Oh yeah, one other. There's a mic back here, and if you want to ask questions of the speakers, you go to the mic and you say who you are and your affiliation, and you can ask questions. Yeah, you, know, you got to turn the mic on, please. Oh, yeah. It's that. Just hold that button down until the green light comes on. Select, I think. How to turn on the microphone? Yeah, how, how do you turn on the microphone? I got you press it. the select button and hold <laughs> yeah. it. Actually, it's the mode button. So oh, okay. See, I got the bad info. All right, go ahead, sir. Got it. Um, no, I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation to the U.S. and how do we? How do I help and and how do I get on some of these things? It, it's like um, I'm way into politics. I was a a national delegate to the Republican convention in Tampa. And I found that it's just good to have a person in the room when the stupid ideas first come up. So I want to find out how I can be a person in the room um, when uh, to kind of influence some of these decisions for small business. Well, you can join either one of those standards groups. I think ASTM is 70 or $75 a year. And uh, RTCA, I'm not sure what the current um, dues are for a year, but you can participate in those. Uh, like I had said, I participated in the ASTM for about five years, and they have meetings all around, and you have to travel, and you spend time on the phone, and it becomes very frustrating after several years of funding it out of your own pocket when they're, well, hemming and hawing and nothing's getting done. I think if we had more small business participation on these meetings and held their feet to the fire and said, you know, we're not going to drag this out for three years. You know, this idea, not working, and we don't like it. It's consensus standards is what they call it, but it's not really a consensus of everyone in the room. It's a consensus of the people that are the most active. And those that are most active are usually the people that work for the vendors because they're getting paid to go to the meetings. And it's, you know, if someone was paying me to fly all over the world and sit there like a bump on a log, I'm like, Psh, that can go for 20 years, whatever. I'll retire doing this. The people that are in small business, that's money that you're taking out of the kitty for development and for business development and uh, anything else that you may need, paying for your insurance and everything else. So they need to kind of tweak that a little bit and realize, and they have to hear from the community that we can't let this drag on for years. So I would, I would inquire with the, um, those two standards organizations and say, I'm interested in joining and ask them about it. Are we gonna are we gonna be kicking something out here, or are we gonna what are we doing? And that would be my suggestion. And joining the R Kappa and other groups um, that are trying to move the ball forward. Cool. Should I leave the mic on? Uh, there, yeah, you probably should leave the mic on. Are there any more questions? Go ahead, sir. Yes. Hello. I am from Costa Rica, and I just wanted to t let, let you know that this is a world movement. It's not only the United States. Right. No, I, I realize that. All over the world. So you saw what happened in France. So, you know, we are a little country with no army. So that makes like a paradise because we, you can fill there everything you want. You can do everything you want. So we, we just started a business. We are Costa Ricans uh, with uh, uh, drones in Costa Rica because they're doing lots of commercials using these equipment and the sky is free there. Right. <laughs> but I just wanted to let you know that this is a global mo movement and uh, many things are happening. Well, I'm, you know, it's good that you brought that up because I'm very into the global airspace integration effort. And in South America, uh, they can fly. They're flying in Brazil, Costa Rica. They're flying in a lot of different countries. And even the Brazilians, you know, I got to call it Christmas from Bogota. 
oh, you know, I was down in Brazil and they're using these for ag and they think that they're going to, this using them for agriculture is going to, let's say, help them be on par with uh, production in the United States. Sounds great. Okay, they're using them. Using them, and I think there's about 10 countries in Europe and Japan, uh, South America. Uh, you can use them in South Africa. So it is going on everywhere. And unfortunately, as Americans, most of us go, oh, well, you know, if you can't use them in America, it's kind of off the radar. But that's not really true. And we're going to hear from, uh, we actually have a lot of uh, people from Europe here, and we're going to hear how these people are actually making money, and the public acceptance is starting to happen, and people are starting to realize, hey, you know, these, um, these drones aren't scary. They don't want to kill me. They want to help us feed a hungry world. They want to help us manage our public and private assets, and they want to help, you know, with the foresty, forestry and some other things. So it is a worldwide movement. We're a little behind the curve. Gabe, go for it. Hey, uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Gabe Ladd. I'm America I have my own consulting com company, Advanced Concepts Consulting. And Pat, I wanted to mention you haven't talked at all about the other data side of this picture, which is the uh, imaging societies. America's Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing is starting to get on board with the UAS side of things, along with the MAPS organizations. So don't forget those when you're looking at places to participate. There, there is a groundswell from let's say business that can use this technology. And really, you know, I, I keep talking to people, they, they say, oh, well, the drones, you know. Really, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's the data collection. It's really the data that you're delivering. Most of the scientists I talk to on the podcast, they don't care how you get the data. It could be on the back of a unicorn. Just get me the data I can use. But there is a groundswell, and people see that. And we're going to have a bunch of speakers who are going to talk about the data the professional data, the scientific data that you can get from unmanned aircraft. And the beauty of it all is it's all self-guided um, data collection. That is the beauty of this technology. Goes there. Uh, hi, Pat. Um, very quick, can you give us a little update on enforcement? You've talked a lot about regulation and a lot of a need for regulation. I think that's obvious. Any new technology, you see this in every industry. Well, do you mean enforcement in the United States? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> so, well, um, you know, Mr. Williams from the FAA is here, and he's going to speak. He's actually doing an extended hour long. He's going to do a presentation, and then he's going to do 30 minutes of question and answer, and I think I will let, um, I will defer to him so he can be the bad guy, and I don't have to be the, uh, I don't have to be the bearer of bad news. Hi, my name's Matt, and uh, basically I just wanted to see if you guys have the opportunity soon to publish some sort of community-based standards for operation. I know we'd like to have something put forward for FAA regulation, et cetera. Is there guidelines out there now that we can basically hand to anybody in the industry, hey, you're flying your Phantom yes. right here, this is not a good idea to put it over a crowd, et cetera, so, so there, right. there has been, and there has been, they've been out there since uh, 2000, late 2007 and 2008. Mm -hmm. And they're the RCAP proposed guidelines. And I actually brought those and submitted those when I was on the small UAS arc. And I will also say they were given to the other CEA, CAAs around the world, like UK CAA, and they actually incorporated some of that in their stuff. And the same with the International Coordination Council in Europe incorporated some of that stuff. The only people who are, that I know of that haven't incorporated any of that stuff is the FAA. Thank you. So look for them. All right, one more. And I mean, I could do this all day, but we got... Uh, we got other speakers, damn it. Go Hi. ahead. My name is Miguel, I'm from Hawaii, and actually, uh, I'm not sure if it's a stupid question, but- No, no stupid good. questions. Um, we have colleagues that uh, work in uh, Pacific Islands, and I'm wondering, um, what are the FAA regulations in the US flag territories versus overseas? I mean, do those still apply to what applies on the mainland? Um, that's a good question, and I'm going to, um, Dodge that one, and you can ask Mr. Williams that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any more questions? One more. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay. Um, we're going to open it up to the uh, the next speaker, and um, that's a good buddy of mine, Mr. Doug Davis. I know Doug now for oh, I don't know. I've been busting Doug's chops since probably, what, 2005? <laughs> Every time he'd pick up the flow and, hello, hey, it's Patrick. Oh, oh. 
Anyway, he's a great guy. Uh, he was the manager of the FAA UAPO office years ago. Uh, he was working at New Mexico State University Physical Science Laboratory, and he just got a new job, and we'll let him come up here and tell us all about it. So please welcome Doug, Doug Davis.